Thank you so much for this open mic. I'm, I'm going to sit down for a minute. Um, thank you, uh, the teacher. So, and all, every single one, I don't want to sing like one, every, anyone specifically, but there's so many of you who made extraordinary contribution to this wonderful evening. Uh, as I listen to Frank Smith's poem in honor of his father, I thought about Horace Silver's song for my father with lyrics by Leon Thomas as well. Oh, every single one of you, I'm free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. I, um, I've been with this struggle with Nissan workers for now about a year and a half. When I first went down to Mississippi in June of, of last year, uh, in a conversation uh, in, in celebrating mega efforts, I, I made a statement that, that indeed mega efforts would be supporting, if alive today, supporting of Nissan workers right their right to to have a union, to vote to have a union. And certainly, I want to thank the Mississippi Students Alliance for Justice. I'm also concerned students, students for a better Nissan. All these are the stories I, that we must tell, continue to tell. As we hear from every single one of, of the participants, their commitment to struggle, their commitment to justice. Paul Robinson once says, an artist either fights for freedom or he fights for slavery. Mm. If the artist makes a choice, whose side he's on in the world? And Paul Robinson prophetically, profoundly said, I've made my choice. Let's give another hand for Andy here. The people, the people there. <laughs> for all his contribution. <laughs> well, you know, when, as I listened to these spoken words artists, I was reminded, I remember the fact that I had the fortune more than 46 years ago of being a student of Sonia Sanchez at San Francisco College. And, and I first heard poetry reading, the poetry readings, poets such as Reggie Lockett who was a, a, my contemporary at San Francisco State. And many of those who were poets, spoken word artists, even Huey P. Newton, hearing Huey P. Newton, the founder, one of the founders of the Black Panther Party, read poetry at the Black House where Ed Bullens lived and, and, and several other artists, Marvin Jackman and Marvin X, as well as Elders Cleaver at the time. But more than anything else, I've had the opportunity for more than a quarter of a century to kind of read the works of many poets from Pablo Neruda to um, Langston Hughes, Gwendolyn Brooks, just around the country. And each point in time that, that I've been able to use poetry as a platform, unfortunately, I'm not, I don't consider myself a writer, but to read poetry as a platform, it, it provides us the very vehicle that we need to, to begin to talk about who we are, where we're going. It's Martin Luther King in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Community of Chaos. I've had the opportunity to just to read the works of Langston Hughes. Uh, at various points over the last quarter of a century. And each time, whether it was the end of apartheid, I've also been privileged to be able to read and connect his work along with other works to those, those extraordinary historic moments. Or as I think about this last week when I was at Bunker Hill at Community College in Boston last week, Yesterday, rather, last night, last week, last night. I'm getting last, last week and last night all confused, you know what I'm saying? Fresh in my mind was 
was the thoughts of 12 years a slave. And as, as a friend of mine once said, uh, said, said to me after seeing the film, he, tells, he said his brother told him, don't want to go see it, run to go see it. So I, I thought about that, and, and to bring this into some sort of context, I'm gonna read a, a couple of, of poems, certainly in my thoughts, think go back to the 19-year-old sister who was murdered in cold blood in Dearborn Heights, Mississippi just recently. Or the young Hispanic boy murdered by a weapons specialist who supposedly masqueraded as a sheriff in Sonoma County just recently. Or of course, the case that we've been talking about for nearly two years, the case of Trayvon Martin as well. So let me read, first of all, a couple points. Once again, I want to thank you for being here and all the world, all the work that you do in the service of justice, in the service of truth. And as you march and grow and as young men and women, in that, in that sense, you're marching and growing in our hearts always. Thank you so much. As we mark the 50th year of the March on Washington and the 150th year of the Emancipation Proclamation, I want to read a poem we also mark year of the bombing of the church in Birmingham, Alabama, where four little girls were killed. Birmingham Sunday, September 15, 1963. Four little girls who went to Sunday school that day and never came back home at all, but left and stared their blood upon the wall. It got smattered, it splattered flesh and bloody Sunday dresses torn to shred by dynamite that China made eons ago, did not know that what China made before China was ever red at all, with red and with their blood this Birmingham on Sunday wall. Four tiny girls who left their blood upon that wall in little graves today await the dynamite that might ignite the fumes of centuries of dragon kings whose Tomorrow, sing a hymn the missionaries never taught Chinese in Christian Sunday school to implement the golden rule. Four little girls might be awakened someday soon by songs upon the breeze, as yet unfelt among magnolia trees. By songs upon the breeze, as yet unfelt among magnolia trees. the way there's a specific scene in 12 Years a Slave that, that was very, so many scenes. I want you, as my friend said, don't want to go see it, run to go see it. This poem that I'm going to read now, it's a poem written in 1942. It was dedicated in memory of Charlie Lang and, and Ernest Green, both 14-year-old, who were lynched together beneath the Shibuta Bridge over the Chaka, uh, the Chakasahay River in Mississippi on October 12, 1942. And October felt we were just about our second year in World War II, our involvement, that second year of World War II in our fight to end fascism and fight for freedom. Bitter River. There's a bitter river flowing through the south. Too long has the taste of its water been in my mouth. There's a bitter river dark with filth and mud. Too long has its evil poison poisoned my blood. I drunk of the bitter river, and its gall coats the red of my tongue, mixed with the blood of the lynch boys from its iron bridge hung. Mixed with the hopes, 
that are drowned there in the snake-like hiss of its stream, where I drank of the bitter wither that, that strangled my dream. The book study, but useless, too handled but unused, knowledge acquired but thrown away, ambition battered and bruised, or water of the bitter river with your taste of blood and clay. You reflect no stars by night, no sun by day. The bitter river reflects no stars. It gives back only the glint of steel bars and dark bitter faces behind steel bars. The Scottsboro boys behind steel bars. Lewis Jones behind steel bars. The vote the sharecropper behind steel bars. The labor leader behind steel bars. The soldier thrown from a Jim Crow bus behind steel bars. The 15 cent mother behind steel bars. The girl who sells her body behind steel bars. And my graf grandfather's back with his ladder of scars. Long ago, long ago, the whip and the steel bars. The bitter river reflects no stars. Wait, be patient, you say. Your folks will have a better day. But the swirl of the bitter river takes your words away. Work, education. Patience will bring a better day, but the swirl of the bitter river carries your patience away. Disruptor, agitator, troublemaker, you say. The swirl of the bitter river sweeps your lives away. I did not ask, did not ask for this river, nor the taste of this bitter brew. I was given this water as a gift from you. Yours has been the power that forced my back to the wall and made me drink from the bitter cup mixed with blood and gall. You have lynched my comrades where the iron bridge crosses the stream, underpaid me for my labor and spit in the face of my dreams. You forced me 